you're, you're not going to get that. How about this, uh, Josh, from, from Tony Pascarello at Goldman Sachs, again, head of their hedge fund client coverage, was with me yesterday um, on our closing bell or, or the day before. Listen to this. In Q4, the MAG7 grew sales by 15% year over year and lifted margins by 607 basis points year on year, leading to earnings growth of 60%. In contrast, the remaining 493 stocks in the S&P 500 grew sales by 3% year over year, okay? So we're comparing 15% to 3%, while margins contracted by 59 basis points, such that earnings fell by 2%. You want to know why people can continue to go to the MAG-7? Beginning, well, middle, end, that's everything right well, there. Yeah, I mean, this has been, that's the explanation for why we are where we are, why there's been this massive outperformance. It turns out it's not index funds driving this. It's not some, uh, some uh, evil black magic. It's, it's basically fundamentals, and the fundamentals for these companies are appreciating at a more rapid rate than they have been for almost any other type of stock out there. There are some exceptions. You could throw the Eli Lilly's uh, and the AbbVie's for, for the healthcare group. I could probably find you some industrials that have kept up. Um, somebody hilariously was showing me that Abercrombie & Fitch has outperformed NVIDIA uh, over the last year. So sure, there are some other names, but this theme has been so dominant because, to Tony's point, the fundamental have been the driver behind uh, why these stocks, ex-Tesla, have done what they do and continue to. Mm -hmm. But that's not really, for me, that's not really the question. One of the things I've been talking about is I think things have gotten a little bit out of control, not because the fundamentals are good, but because this game has become too easy to play. Everybody knows you wake up and you buy Meta and you're fine. I question whether or not that game has a lot, uh, a lot more gas left in the tank. The NASDAQ 100 peaked on February 12th, had one of the worst, uh, had the worst day of the year. Then it recovered, but to lower highs on February 16th. Here we are today with another recovery for the NASDAQ, not quite back at those uh, uh, February 12th and February 16th levels. And look at Apple. Stock is not enjoying itself today. No, like it's. Well, it it's looks great, like it wants it? to go red. No, it, you know what? Yesterday it was it was about to break through 180. So it's it's bounced a little bit. Now it's like you know 180. Why oh, isn't Microsoft up six percent today? Answer me that. If if because things everybody are, owns it. But, but my point is, if things are so gangbusters for right. NVIDIA, theoretically, that should speak to what's going on with Microsoft's AI products, which are now what you're betting on if you mm. buy the stock. Why isn't that stock going nuts? Why isn't Apple giving you the follow through? Because, because Apple's not viewed as an AI stock. And, yet. And you get, you, yet. yet. I, I totally agree with you. I, I've been buying it, right? WWDC, I think, is going to be the event in June that we want to focus on because I think that's when they're going to announce yep. AI things. My only point is so, I'm worried about the NASDAQ. I'm worried about right. the Nasdaq overall, well, it's that, not making a new high right at this moment. But, but I will say, come on. I mean, some of the semi-cap equipment names are up huge. Some of the software companies Stipulated. are Stipulated. AI touches so many different pieces within technology. And so I do think that this, them having a really good number, numbers going higher, mm -hmm. is going to have a positive halo effect. But maybe it's not just technology that works. Maybe it's well, other things. Okay. It's a broadening we'll out. We are that. seeing a we, broadening we, we, out. We, we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, Staying on the mega cap thing for a second, because Jim Labenthal, you talk about, you know, buying high. You better hope these things are going to continue to work. You bought Amazon. I, okay, oh, I was wondering. Amazon. I was wondering how Mr. you were going to set that up. Value, the value valuation. Wait a second. I was wondering <laughs> how you were going to set that up because I, I heard. You, listen, I, I do. I heard. Uh, well, you did not disappoint. <laughs> uh, you never do. But, folks, this is not an expensive stock. Pause for impact. It's not an expensive stock. I got you 40 times forward earnings. Listen, there's a new sheriff in town, Andrew Jassy. They're not spending as much in R&D as they used to. They're still spending a lot, but there's a lot of earnings that have been hidden for quite some time that are being uncovered. I think that 40 times multiple is frankly too high. I think the earnings are going to come in higher. Fundamentally, you can see that in terms of a fully employed consumer. Look at weekly jobless claims today. That's going to continue to buy uh, on, on the Internet, as well as Amazon Web Services. But putting this together, when I say it's inexpensive, the peg ratio, again, mentioned it earlier, that's the price to earnings ratio versus the long-term growth rate, is 1.5. That is very attractive for a stock and last thing and probably should have led with this. You know, over the last three and a half years, the stock has gone nowhere. I, I mean, it has been dead money for three and a half years. I Thanks. think that's a huge base. I mean, I'll appeal to uh, you, you know, the technician here. Would you be surprised if it turns out that this is the secret stock that Berkshire Hathaway is accumulating? Mm. Uh, interesting. interesting. Would you be like, totally shocked? 
stock, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. It's one of the few stocks that's big enough to move the needle. Okay. It's a stock that he has publicly said, and Charlie, uh, rest in peace, has said they missed it. They should have been smart enough to buy it. Stock's done nothing for three years. This is my guess for when we get that. And I own Berkshire, too, so I'll be double Double exposed. Me too. Me too. This is my this is my guess. I think this is what they're they're buying. But can wow. we acknowledge this sold actually... Pound Down Global, by the way, Berkshire. <laughs> so it's like, it's like a lot of clues. Jeez, really? Uh, like, let me get we'll that get knife to, out we'll of my to, back. We'll get to Berkshire <laughs> stuff coming up in a little bit. But Steph, I want your take too, because you own Amazon, and yeah. you know, the, again, tried and true value investor. At some point, said, yeah, you got to pay up. It's not expensive. You got to pay yeah, up for it. for growth for great companies. I, I bought it in October when the stock fell on the quarter that was supposedly bad, and I just thought it was really good. And there's a lot of ways. To win with AWS accelerating, retail margins going higher, free cash flow going through the roof. And so I think you're right, Jassy actually, the CEO does have good, better discipline, but I want him to continue to spend. And so I do They're think spend 40 like 100 times billion is, on RG. 40, yeah, 40, 40, 40 times is it's not expensive, but again, again, it's if, not you 40 can times. Get, if you can get acceleration in AWS, that will be very, very important. Um, and that's the margin driver. So I think that's really a, a key. And remember, like the last 10 years, the stock has traded like a hundred well, times. I, I, can I posit that you can't, as a, as value investors, you can't necessarily, I, I guess I want your takes on this, it's a question, I'm not trying to make a declarative statement. Can you necessarily look at valuation today the same way you would a couple of decades ago, just based on growth in areas like cloud sure. and AI? in which NVIDIA and Amazon, which once both of you as bottoms up value investors would say, absolutely no touch, no way. And here I have both of you in two stocks that have at various times, including in some respects now for NVIDIA, been deemed as the poster stocks of high valuation, high growth. First and foremost, I was buying Amazon at 600. You remember that. That was way, way, way a lot. And then I sold it, which was a bad move, but I've made so much money on it. Sometimes you have to look at valuation relative to its historical average and sometimes on an absolute basis. And if you, maybe it's justifying missing a stock and trying to get into, but I don't think you can ignore all of these total addressable markets of what you just said, all of these various different pieces, this is the real deal. And so I want to have exposure to that. Um, and I'm trying to figure out if, you know, when something gets more attractive, again, relative mm -hmm. to itself. I hear you, but I, I, and I do remember when you first bought Amazon, it was maybe five, five years ago, yeah. six years ago, something like that. And for a lot of value investors, you'd say, well, why don't you own Amazon? And it was really nothing more than it's just too expensive. I've been having this fight with these people. Judge, I've been having this fight with these people for years and years. One of the things that I have <laughs> always said, come on, come on. I know. One of the I things I've always said is that traditional measures of valuation, number one, are backward looking. But number two, did not envision the dominance of these types of companies. Amazon decided. Hey, hey, four, hey listen. Well, wait, hold on. I got oh, Amazon decided four years ago. Hey, guess what? We're going to start an advertising business. It's the third largest advertising business in the world. Brother. Three years later, how do you how do you value on a price earnings basis Brother a company Josh. that could decide to do that? Brother Josh, I got you. Here's the thing: when we talk about valuation, I know it drives you crazy. Sometimes you're right. Sometimes Steph and I are right. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you were buying this stock three and a half years ago, it has been a dog for the last Not three and a half years. Not because of valuation. Fine. What I'm saying, oh, hang on a second there, my, right, my right. hot friend, okay? What I'm saying is I am not turning in my value card, okay? I'm not giving up my credentials. No, you're just putting it in the drawer and pretending like you don't have it. No, it's like you're stop taking it. off your wedding ring, walking into a party. It is nothing we know like what that. you're doing, Jimmy. Oh, God, what are you, what are you saying? Under, That's awful. It did hang not, on a wait a second. He's it did not, not for three, it did not underperform <laughs> for three years because of COVID. It underperformed because they couldn't deliver operating leverage. They couldn't deliver the top at the same time, the bottom line. Guys, right? Margins were depressed. Fair. That's, and not, then you get a that's not a valuation person. issue. That's peg execution. Ratio. Peg ratio. Value is about the peg ratio. It's not, not about buying stocks at five times earnings that can't grow their earnings. That interests nobody, including value investors. If you're growing your earnings at 26%, which is what FactSet thinks is the long-term growth rate for Amazon, I think that's too low. A 40 times multiple is a very attractive price to pay for it. I'm done. All right. Good stuff. Let's take a quick break. All right. <laughs> Sell Snowflake ahead of earnings next week. All right. So, knew this was going to be controversial. Mm -hmm. I know you're not going to like it. No. They, uh, the stock is, well, in, in the two, where is it, 226. They say it targets should be 160. And the commentary they have, quote, 
benefiting from an overly exuberant tech market and riding the coattails of an unprecedented AI hype cycle. Okay, that's null and void after NVIDIA. So right there, in my mind, I mean, look, I, th I think that the lifeblood of AI is data and quality data mm -hmm. and accessibility at size and at scale, and that's what these guys do. It is not cheap at all. We've talked about it. It trades about 19 times price to sales, but historically it's traded about 37 times price to sales. I'm not, I, I hope it doesn't rally into the print. I don't want expectations to get carried away, but I am in this for a, a really long time because I believe in what they're doing and what we're hearing. I mean, the inference number from NVIDIA I mentioned before, that is huge for these guys. It's all about data and clean data. And so if it sells off, it's a small position, Scott. If it sells off, I'll be, I'll be, I'll definitely be big adding. Brad Gerstner name. We've talked about uh, yeah. every time he's got a big position in that stock and, and has had uh, since before the IPO. Uh, AbV, Bryn, is looking to sell at least $13 billion of bonds to fund M&A, according to reports. You own the stock? Yeah, so they're doing the bond offering to actually fund the M&A they've already done. In the fourth quarter, they spent about $18 billion to acquire Cerevel and Immunogen. And so this bond offering will be to help fund those deals they've already done. I think what's also interesting is Earlier this week, the CEO, who had been there for 10 years, is retiring. They're promoting the CEO to CEO. So they've done two big acquisitions. You now have a leadership change. So, so far, the market's enjoyed, Avi has enjoyed a really nice run year to date. Mm -hmm. But over the next year mm -hmm. or so, it's going to come to execution and their ability to absorb these two big acquisitions and actually monetize that as Humera comes down. So. Uh, it's had a good run. I'm actually looking at this to somewhat take profits because I do think the market's going to be much more um, hard on this name with the new CEO uncertainty and digesting $20 billion of acquisitions. Okay. Jimmy, you own it too. Similar assessment or, or no? Very similar. And also, I, I just want to mention the valuation because it matters. Around 15 times earnings with a 3.5% dividend yield, you're getting a very innovative company at a cheap price with cash flow that comes back to you. I also, by the way, think that it's emblematic of what's going on with health care in general. Coming back from a really terrible 2023, I think there's a lot of names that are in the process of doing what AbbVie has done for the last several months, which is really soar higher. Okay. Uh, PG&E, you want to take that, too, after the earnings beat? Yeah, I mean, I said this uh, yesterday, that this is the opposite end of the drama spectrum from NVIDIA or Snowflake or any Amazon, any of these names. This is a utility. It's doing exactly what I want it to do. It's lowering the volatility overall in the portfolio. It's giving up good results. It's very well run by Patty Poppy. She's the CEO there. Uh, coming back from four years ago when it came out of bankruptcy from the forest fires, the sentiment is turning on this name. And although it's down a little bit today, you can see in the operation, results. It's really well run. It's a good company. This should slowly trickle higher over the rest of this year. Oh, On a big company. day for technology stocks. Berkshire Hathaway, let's move there, hitting a new all-time high in its own right today ahead of earnings this weekend. The annual meeting, company's cash pile surge to be a big focus. All right, so they're sitting, Josh, on $157.2 billion. Yep. What are they going to do with that? That's the speculation. I don't know. It's, these are high-class problems to have. They're probably earning more in money markets and treasuries than they've, they've ever earned, period, on their cash, just given how much cash there is. And now it's a 5% yield. You look at the last 15 years of what they could have earned just managing that cash. It's nothing compared to today. Uh, they're certainly not buying back any stock. We know that from, from last quarter they barely did. And the stock's done nothing but go higher. Uh, they have no rule in place official rule. They have talked about it as a function of uh, book value, but that kind of went out the window. I'd be very surprised if they bought back a ton more stock. So the question is, like, is there a massive acquisition they could do? Because I don't think they're looking to just throw it at a, a bunch of stocks or, or build up positions uh, like, a, like a, a regular investor would. I think they still want to be strategic if the right thing comes along. The problem is everything is up. Home prices are up. Commodities are up. Almost every type of stock is up. So there aren't better deals this quarter than there were last quarter. I think most of what we'll read in the letter will be an encomium to uh, the late Charlie Munger. Uh, I don't think there's going to be anything particularly revolutionary. I do think it's interesting, though, that the company has been selling down the position in uh, Paramount, which was clearly a disaster. There might be some commentary in there about Todd and Ted, who are running the $350 billion stock portfolio, half of which is now Apple. Maybe there'll be some more color about what their plans are. 
um, to take more of, of the reins of the investing side. And maybe there'll be some commentary about Japan. This was one of uh, Berkshire's big strategic uh, investments in the in in the portfolio. They bought shares in multiple uh, Japanese trading houses. And look at the Japanese stock market. It has had this 35-year awakening. All-time high for yep. the Nikkei. Yep. And not a lot of people saw that coming. Apparently, Berkshire sort of saw that coming. Uh, and those investments probably look really wise in, in hindsight. So those are the things that, that I'll be personally uh, paying attention to. But you also, you know, threw out earlier your belief uh, or guess that Amazon is this well, they own Amazon stock. Well, it's, it's a guess based on literally not. I've never even been to Omaha, okay? So everyone, like, <laughs> relax. Don't, Have don't, you had an Omaha steak? Don't aggregate this into, <laughs> into a, a news story on your blog, please. But, but they do own Amazon. It does fit a lot of the characteristics of a classic Berkshire stock. They like these kinds of companies that have a very uh, wide and deep economic moat. They like companies that have been around for a long time. They like companies that have huge market share in the categories they play in. And they like companies where they've had a long time to observe management. And Amazon ticks a lot of those boxes. The fact that it was just added to the Dow, I think, should also not be lost uh, on anyone. Mm. Of course, Berkshire Hathaway famously owns and has owned many Dow components uh, in the past. So uh, the last thing I would say on that is they, they have historically had an aversion to tech. That ended 10 years ago when they started to accumulate Apple. Amazon's not even in the tech index. It's considered a consumer discretionary stock, hilariously, probably because the retail business is a $100 billion annual business. Um, but I just think it's possible, and it would, be, uh, it would be cool if so. Jimmy, you own it too. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, Josh did a great uh, discussion of the public stocks, but it's the private companies that he owns that really interest me. Yep. I mean, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, we've seen the railroads have been on a tear here, and there's actually been a lot of room for operational improvement at Burlington Northern Santa Fe. I'm going to look for what they say about about that. Oh, by the way, if you looked at insurance stocks recently, they have been on an absolute tear, and insurance is a huge part of Berkshire Hathaway's business. So it's not just the public stocks, it's the private companies as well that have been propelling this. Let's see what they say uh, about insur them. Cat catastrophe insurance, they wrote a big policy in Florida for 2023. There weren't any catastrophic yeah. storms. That's probably a feather in Ajit Jain's cap. Mm -hmm. uh, some good underwriting there, too. Insurance is a really big part of, uh, of the earnings picture here. All right, coming up next, one let's talk about shares of Chenier today. They're down about 3.5% as we look right now. Jimmy, you own this, right? Yeah. 39% plunge in revenue. I mean, natural gas is $1.50. Is that the whole story? It really kind mm -hmm. of is because it's reflective of demand, right? You had uh, warmer than expected winter in Europe, so they're not demanding as much liquefied natural gas. I'm very much a believer in this story, folks, for the long run. I think LNG is not just here to stay, but it's here to grow. And the U.S. is the major export because we're awash in it. Um, LNG runs the export terminals and pipelines that go to those export terminals. I'm not going to get caught up in one quarter. Their guidance came out, and it was just a touch light, okay? Um, but this is a stock that's attractively priced with a very fundamental reason for it to go higher over the next years, plural, which is demand for LNG, not just from Europe, but from Asia and elsewhere. We're the supplier of it. To get it out of the U.S. and overseas, you've got to go through Chenier. Is that your, when you say years, plural, is that the expectation that you're going to have to wait years, plural? for the rewards of being in this stock well, not, now? No, I don't think so, because as you pointed out, natural gas at $1.50, I mean, uh, that seems to me very, very low. You think? Um, I do. I Why do. is the dividend so low? Because this is because in the, this is in the MLP bucket for because most they're, investors. They're building more terminals is why. So you have to. So then you have to make the bet that that's the right move, not to try to monetize the scarcity of these terminals that exist right now. Yeah, I mean, you I, have to again, bet on the re again, you have the re to have the thesis, which I do, that LNG exports are very much a growth industry. I do believe All right, that. Welcome back, big winners, big losers. We were going to highlight Royal Caribbean, which raised its full year guidance. We could see that DoorDash was upgraded today as well. But then we saw Super Microcomputer, which mm. is up 30%. That is only 226 bucks. I feel like calling this Super Mario Brothers computer because the thing trades like video game style. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is unbelievable. This too, sort of, the stock was 85 bucks. Now it's like, a, it's almost 1,000. The 52-week high is 1,077. You talked about it 
a long time ago. Didn't buy it. Oh, of course sadly. not. Of course not. <laughs> it, would be, it, would be, it would be a six dollar stock if I bought it. Uh, Supermicro is one of these companies that is essential for the retrofitting of old cloud infrastructure slash the new data centers that are being built. Every time NVIDIA gets orders for GPUs to go into one of these data centers, you also are going to need the type of equipment that Supermicro provides. So along with Arista Networks, Anet, another name that we've talked about, this is like in that group now, it moves on AI. This company actually did a huge convert uh, sale and the stock is still higher. So not only do we love the implications of what NVIDIA had to say for Supermicro, we also love dilution apparently, so that's cool. I also think there are a lot of shorts in here playing the video game, today they lost, and uh, I, I would guess this will remain an exciting stock for, for a long, it's only a $50 billion market cap, it doesn't take much to push this yeah, thing around. Yeah, there's today. No we'll do final trades. Bryn, what do you have for us? Uh, JEPQ, best companies in the country, income, and AI. All right, Jimmy. BlackRock. Steph. Fortinet. Josh Brown. Shake Shack at 100. How you like me now? <laughs> I'm looking at the NASDAQ. It's uh, 16,000 again, 420. Funding for NVIDIA secured. I'll and see you on the closing bell. On the halftime report, along with some of the guests, and uh, I try to take the best clips, put it together, and then we're going to do some analysis on the stocks that were discussed on the show itself. And first, we're going to take a look at the heat map here so you can see how the stocks all perform now. It's after the close. It is 5.55 p.m. right now as I'm recording this. You can see all of the tech stocks did quite well, the majority of them. Uh, they were up. Amazon was up. Meta was up. NVIDIA up 16.4%. Uh, but the utility companies, not so good, guys. As you can see, they did not perform well. How about the indices? The indices, the Dow was up 1.18%, NASDAQ up 2.96, S&P 500 up 2.11, and the Russell 2000 was up 0.76%. We're going to go through these stocks that were talked in the show, and if you want to check out the other stocks below, those were discussed on the prior episode, okay? Um, or part one, I suppose. All right, so here's Apple. We're looking at a daily chart. Um it did well today. It was up 1.12%, but it doesn't change the um, situation here. It, Apple has been declining. It's had you know, lower highs. This high here, for example, is lower than that high. This high is lower than that one. That's the definition of a downtrend, but we don't have actually lower lows yet. Um, so what you'll see is price has been getting stuck at that 180, 86 level, some right around there. Let me just draw that trend line so you can see what I'm talking about. And so there's this like, it's kind of range, range bound here. Um, not an optimal time to be entering a long position, especially when price is within the cloud that's uh, in under the moving averages. So I'd stay out of Apple for the time being. Amazon was up 3.55% today, a much more bullish uh, chart as you can see right now, it's moving up, uh, the volume was higher. Everything looks good with Amazon. Um, in fact, but it's the only thing is I it did find some resistance right there at the 175.49 level, that prior high that you see. How about BlackRock Incorporated? So this one has been in a range, right? You see that that range there. So the expectation is that when this thing finally does break above the 818 level. My expectation is it's going to take off and it's going to be an explosive move because that's what typically happens when the price kind of gets coiled up within a range like just like this one. Hasn't happened yet. I'd keep my eye on it though. How about Berkshire Hathaway? Tomorrow is their earnings, February 23rd. So, you know, this one's been doing quite well. It's a little bit extended. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we'll have to wait for that information. This is not the ideal time to enter a long position, especially when price is so far away from its equilibrium level, which is the green line, the Tenkinson. FTNT, uh, we have a crossover of the moving averages. That's negative. It's not bullish. I'd stay out of this for now. Google, same situation. They cro The Tenkinson crossed under the Kijinson back here on uh, February 12th. It's remained under that level. And then it found resistance right at the Kijinson today, even though it was up 1.08%. How about IBM? 
IBM was up 2.51%. I do like this. It was looking pretty bearish yesterday, right, when price closed under the Kijinsen. But with the news, of course, of NVIDIA, price popped. It had a nice gap up. And then I just, uh, so this is, a, you know, this looks much more bullish. I like it. JEPQ, this is JP Morgan NASDAQ Equity Premium Income ETF. This is one of the ETFs that was suggested on at the end of the show. This one broke through this high level, the, this uh, resistance level of 52.70. And so it's looking like a, a pretty strong buy as far as I'm concerned. Uh, let's see, LNG, that's the oil and gas midstream. Very bearish, guys. Uh, today, their earnings came out. They had positive earnings from what I saw, but uh, it didn't uh, really affect the price because if you look, uh, this is the closing price, right? Uh, 157.68. And after market, let's see if there's anything. I don't think much happened. Yeah, it just dropped a little bit more down to 4.19%. So I don't know. Maybe the information will be you know, digested tomorrow, and then we'll see a, a change. But as far as I'm concerned, I'd stay out of this stock. It's also under the moving averages and the cloud. By the way, the software that I use here is called TC2000, and the prior software was called Finviz Elite. Uh, you can find links for those both down below in the description section. All right, let's look at Meta. Meta it, it did well today. It was up 3.87%. It found some resistance um, to, on that based on that high um, on February 15th. So, you know, but it's it's very bullish. I mean, I like what I'm seeing with Meta. I like it. Microsoft, also very bullish. It, now, Microsoft, similar to the prior stock, had dropped, uh, not this one, but the other one that I mentioned had closed under the Kijinsen. Today, it gapped up, right? It had a nice big gap up, It was and uh, it was up 2.35%. This looks really good. As far as I'm concerned, um, Nvidia, and that was you know Met, Microsoft, you know like Josh mentioned, you know how the technology stocks didn't seem to be doing so well. Well, th here's some evidence right here that it, Microsoft reacted to the news of Nvidia right there. You know, Google, another AI company, also reacted. It was up 1.08. Nothing crazy, but these are really you know large companies that aren't going to like you know jump 10, 15, 20 percent as you'll see with SMCI in a second when I get to that one. All right, let's look at uh, NVIDIA. That was, of course, the one that you know jumped the most with the earnings that came out yesterday afternoon, up 16.4%. It had found support of the Kijinsen and then just popped. It gapped up overnight, 11.19%, and then today it continued to move up. How about Shake Shack? That's one of the stocks that Josh mentioned. Uh, it was up 1.26%, but in my opinion, it's a bit overextended, especially above the Tenkinson and Kijinson. Not an ideal time, uh, in my opinion, to, to go long. Um, if you're holding it, that's great, but uh, not, you know, not for a new entry. How about SMCI, Super Microcomputer? Well, this is the one that, you know, we had the big drop, right, that took place um, on February 16th. And then it dropped a little bit more, finding, finding support right on that Kijinsen, the red line, literally right on there, right on the mark. And then the next day, you know, it closed a little bit lower, stayed above that level. And then today with the, you know, it looked like the, they were waiting for those news to come out regarding NVIDIA. And this one benefited the most, up 32.87%. I mean, pretty insane. And uh, when we take a look at SMCI, Let's take a look at SMCI and Finviz Elite for a second. Let's look at their fundamentals quickly. Um, you'll see sales quarter to quarter, sales quarter over quarter, one hundred and three point two five percent. Okay, earnings per share, quarter to quarter, sixty two point four one percent. They don't have any long term debt. Okay, zero point zero three. It says here. Um, you know, the last sales surprise was 23.39%. Earnings per share surprise was 8.38%. Uh, we're looking at also, how did this stock perform for the year? It's up 1,000 over the last 12 months. You see that right there, 1,007.79% for this stock. And for the year to date, it's up 243.18. But it's a very volatile stock. And just as it, jumped 30% today, it could, you could have a very similar, 
you know, um, break down in the near future at some point when some negative news comes out. So just keep that in mind. You may not want to go with a very high portion of your portfolio in this stock uh, and uh, have more diversification. So anyway, if you guys liked this video and you haven't subscribed yet, this is probably the perfect time to do it. Um, and that's because there's also a discount below if you decide that you wanted to um, check out the TC2000 software and it's available to subscribers. And the other thing, don't forget to hit the like button. It helps with the algorithm. And I'll catch you guys all in the next video.